Our speaker today, uh, Professor Lawrence Krauss. Professor Lawrence Krauss, this is his third talk. Uh, the first time he talked about uh, China and uh, India and uh, Brazil. Then he talked about, uh, the second lecture was about Europe, and today is about the United States. And I think you'll find it very interesting. Well, again, we're focusing on growth and this time on the United States. Uh, as I said in the first lecture, potential growth is a function of two things, uh, productivity advance and growth in the labor force. Actual growth in any one year depends on effective demand and how much we get. So this is, focusing now on uh, potential growth in the United States. And if we look at the data, I didn't put up a chart because it's just variance up and down like a heart meter. Uh, if you look at it, it is very irregular and huge quarter to quarter and year to year variance. Great amount of variance. How, from plus 10 in a year to minus 6 in a year. Uh, in part, it's that variance because it's often measured as a residual. So you get other kinds of errors mixed in. But if you take a weighted average over time, it's a consistent trend of 2%. 2%. Now, I am confident that that trend will continue. You have to consider that 2% as the growth of the technology frontier, where what we know uh, as possible. There are two reasons why I am confident. One is some substantive reasons, which I'll come to in the next slide. But there's also a forecasting technique that convinces me, a technique that I learned from Herman Kahn. And his point was, when you have a series that you're trying to forecast, and it shows great variability, but a strong, consistent trend, your best forecasting tool is a ruler. So that's what I've used. I've used a ruler to suggest that 2% will likely be the growth uh, over, uh, likely to continue in the future. The second factor is uh, the growth in the labor force. Up to about 1970, the labor force was growing about 2%. Now, that 2% came because we were getting increased participation of women in the labor force. That was one factor. And the baby boom generation was getting old enough to enter the labor force. But more recently, that growth in the labor force has come down to about 7%. So if we add the 2% to the 7, uh, 7 0.7%, we will get a measure of potential growth per year of 2.7%. Now, those of you in the audience that are mathematicians will recognize that I've ignored the interaction effects. Given this uh, imprecise nature of measurement, that's a small matter to deal with. Okay, so uh, the rate declined to about 7%, uh, seven, uh, growth of the labor force down to 0.7%, pretty much from uh, total factor uh, 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 measurement rate in the U.S. was about 2.1%. Now, if that was a steady state, then you would believe that the labor force would stay stable, would not have any growth.
But of course, we have immigration. And immigration gives us some growth in the labor force. That's if you're at full employment and staying at full employment. But if you're in a re recovery from a recession and you have unemployment, then you can grow more than 2.7% in the year. Well, how much more? Arthur Oaken, who was a colleague of mine at Yale and at the, in the government, he calculated, and it's accepted as Oaken's law, that if you grow 1% more than the potential, which is 2.7, then one-third of that occurs in unemployment decline. One-third appears in new entrants into the labor force that were previously discouraged workers, and one-third appears as productivity growth. So if you have 1% unemployment above full employment, then you have the potential of 3% more growth. Uh, and uh, so if we look at this recovery and uh, uh, we will see that the, uh, the recovery Well, uh, the recovery uh, has not been uh, uh, large enough to reduce the unemployment rate. I'll come back to that point when we discuss the recession. Okay, what are the real factors that sustain productivity growth? Do we start out with natural resources? The U.S. is truly a blessed country with natural resources. Let's start with energy. The U.S. has some of the best uh, and available coal reserves in the world. Now, we know that coal consumption in the U.S. is going down, but not in the rest of the world. There's still growth in coal consumption and the U.S. is a major provider of that. Secondly, in energy, the conventional way we get oil by drilling, that's still available in the U.S. and has been. And we've been a natural gas producer, traditional ways. Uh, so we've, had, we've been blessed in energy uh, forever. However, there's the new things, fracking, and horizontal drilling. People who I trust think that this is a very big deal. Uh, I know the economist last week poured a sprinkle, sprinkled a little cold water on it, but it's not a factors that are fundamental. Well, why is it such a big deal? It's already reversing the decline of U.S. oil petroleum production, it, they, it's now rising. Furthermore, U.S. natural gas production is above previous uh, uh, maximums. Well, how much of a big deal is this? Obviously, energy is critical to modern society and it immediately reduces U.S. oil imports and helps the balance of payments. What are the results of being less dependent on the rest of the world? If you read the New York Times this morning, the lead right column talks about the reduction of the uh, leverage that Saudi Arabia has in Washington, D.C. That is related to the U.S. being less dependent on imports of oil. There, in addition to the balance of payments help, 
you get a large number of high paying jobs. If you would look at North Dakota, their unemployment rate is 3% or less. I mean, it's an absolutely boom place. That's because of fracking. Uh, but the state with the greatest potential for fracking is California. And Governor Brown recently said, it's now we will uh, consider uh, permitting of fracking because it has great, great advantages. We may have to horizontal drill under Los Angeles, but nevertheless, the potential is great in California. Thirdly, when you have energy uh, domestically, it reduces energy cost uh, and makes our industry more competitive. Those of you that follow the finance pages will see that the measure of oil in the United States has West Texas crude is now trading significantly below the price of crude in Europe. That gives the US a competitive advantage because just uh, everything uh, uh, requires some petroleum, some energy. And it helps the, uh, the uh, fracking helps our environmental uh, concerns too because natural gas is replacing the burning of coal for power and that reduces uh, emissions greatly. So the US carbon emissions has been edging off, and some of that anyway, is be due to fracking. Well, that's just energy. The US is also blessed in agriculture. Uh, agric not only do we have land, we have a tradition of improving technology in agriculture. We established early on the series of land-grant colleges. And a land-grant college, uh, its, uh, uh, its main purpose was to teach farmers how to farm more efficiently. In addition, the U.S. Agriculture the Department of Agriculture, the Agricultural Extension Service, is ubiquitous in the rural areas. It is a second major source of productivity teaching to the farmers. And we have research companies that are, address their research to improving seed selection, whatever, uh, to improve our agricultural output. If you look at the data from much of the post-war period, productivity within agriculture was growing faster than productivity within manufacturing. Now there's a level difference. So when people left agriculture and went into manufacturing, you got a productivity improvement but looking at it within the sector, agriculture uh, productivity rose at least as much. So uh, it, agriculture is, uh, has been important directly. Also, it, we, agriculture provides a major source of exports of the United States. Literally, the US feeds a great deal of the world. Uh, and it helps contain our balance of payments deficit. Well, uh, along with the natural resources, we have an innovative culture. If I was better at moving slides, this would have been over. Uh, but uh, what does an innovation culture mean? It means that Americans are willing and anxious to accept new things and new ideas. That is not true everywhere in the world. 
Let me give you an example. If you were a businessman and you borrowed some money to go into business to try something new and you failed and you went bankrupt, and if you were in Europe or Japan, that may well spell the end of your business career. Not so in the United States. Indeed, there's a quip in Silicon Valley. If you have not been involved in at least one bankruptcy, you're not ready for a real uh, strike because you have to learn from your mistakes. And if you haven't gotten that skill, then you're not ready. So we, we have a very different culture. Uh, you can recover from bankruptcy. Uh, if the third factor uh, that supports uh, is our government support. The government's support matters most in basic research. A business firm, if it thinks <laughs> that the payoff is not going to be for 50 or 100 years, they cannot undertake it. But that's the kind of thing that the National Science Foundation and DARPA, they support such things, and they are critical in starting brand new technologies. So the government support for basic research, even though it's a small part of the total amount of research being done in the country, that is a critical part of that, uh, of that uh, res uh, research. Foundations also do some of that. Indeed, there's a very long tradition of foundations supporting basic research. Andrew Carnegie thought that research would be promoted by libraries, and he used his fortune to promote libraries around the country. It's a very long tradition. And the next factor is research universities. A research university is where human resources are combined with funding and inquisitive students. And this combination yields great advances in technology. If you look at what is considered the 20 top research universities in the world, 17 are in the United States. And six of them are in California. One of them is UCSD. You know, in 53 short years, UCSD has become a major world research institution. I'm amazed. I've been here for half its life. And I was at Harvard and Michigan and Yale, also major universities. But as a smidgen of their life at UCSD, I've been here half its life. I recently heard the Chancellor, Pradeep uh, Khosla, talk about our new strategic plan, which is due out in a couple of months. And he says it promises that this, US, this university will be one of distinction, and I fully believe him. Well, the fifth factor, of course, is our people. We are never satisfied. We are a polyglot culture, a mixture of all peoples, uh, and we got that way because of the great importance of immigration in the past, and it's important for the future. Uh, people from all over the world want to come to the U.S. to study, to work and to invest, and we need to be able to accept them. Uh, it's a critical part of our economic future. Well, let's look at the actual growth of the United States. This is since 1964, and you'll see there's a lot of variance. 
ups and downs. There is a trend that I think you could draw that shows a decline in the actual growth. Uh, that's the decline in potential that I talked about. And it also shows this very sharp decline in the Great Recession of, 19, of 2008 and 9. Let me comment a minute about this deep recession. That was caused by an international rise in oil prices. It generated inflation in the US. And it led to the Federal Reserve under Paul Volcker raising interest rates to unbelievable levels in order to stamp out inflation and inflation uh, expectations. Of course, once you did that, to get a recovery, all you had to do was take your foot off the brake. So it was a lot easier than what we're facing here. Uh, and this is a decline of, of over th about 3% in that year. Uh, and then we had a recovery. Let's look at the next slide. This shows unemployment. And it goes back to the, uh, all of the post-war period. These gray lines represent recessions. And there were 12 recessions. We've had 12 recessions in the post-war period. They seem to be less frequent now than they were back here. Uh, but the 2008-2009 is clearly uh, the most serious. Uh, we reached 10% unemployment. Uh, and uh, it's declined to about 7.3 today. Two thousand eight. It uh, it was. Uh, this is uh, ten percent. Wait a minute. This is the unemployment. Oh, I'm up ten percent, and came down to seven point three. Let me reverse and look at the other slide a minute. If we look at this recovery, it didn't get up much above two percent. Indeed, if you look at it quarter by quarter, there are only three quarters in which it touched 4%. Every other quarter was up down at 2.5. Well, if I've calculated the potential growth correctly, it suggests that unemployment shouldn't have come down at all. I mean, we never got above potential. And the answer to that is that we've had a decline in the participation rate of people from 65.9% of, of the possible working population to 637 That's a decline attributable to discouraged workers but we really don't understand that phenomenon very well, and we don't know whether it can be reversed. Well, why is this Great Recession so different? It's caused by financial mistakes. Excessive uh, risk-taking by financial institutions. Uh, and this excessive lending by banks and other financial institutions led to a housing bubble. Uh, how serious is that bubble? Well, uh, and how serious the mistakes? We know that JP Morgan just paid $13 billion as just part of the settlements for that mistake they made back then. By the way, that mistake includes a, a countrywide, which they bought, and a California savings bank, whose name is escaping me. But Washington yeah, so that 
uh, Washington Mutual. So those, uh, the mistakes, the total of the three made are the, what they're paying for today. Well, it does raise the question, why don't banks and other financial institutions behave such in a way that they uh, would behave better from a societal point of view? They don't want to go bankrupt. So why, uh, why do we care? Why, why do we have to need regulation to save them? Uh, other business firms don't get saved. And the answer is, a bank is not like a butcher shop. When a bank, banks create money. When a small bank goes bankrupt, a small amount of money is extinguished. If a big bank should go bankrupt, then it would impact the economy so severely that the government would be forced to take some action and that's the concept of too big to fail. If you're too big to fail, there's an implicit guarantee by the government they will no, not let that firm fail. So why not take high risk? If your bet comes good, then you will, not only for the bank, but for the individual trader, they make huge benefits from it. So there's all this incentive to be great risk takers. And that's why we need regulation. Whether the, the Dodd-Frank bill will be enough to do that, uh, limit them, depends in part, it's a very complex process. And they, uh, they're trying to write those regulations and implement them carefully. Let me give you a sense of the complication. Suppose you are a bank and you just want to do traditional kind of business. And you're lending money in, uh, in other countries, say in Germany. You may be afraid that the, or let's say Mexico, afraid that the currency will depreciate. So how do you protect yourself? Well, you buy a, uh, a forward contract in the futures market to, uh, to cover your debt. In other words, you can trade in, a, uh, in a, what looks like a speculative market for very good reasons. That is to uh, hedge your bets, which is what we want the big banks to do. But that's in a matter of interpretation. The big whale in London was supposedly hedging the bets of New York uh, for J.P. Morgan, and you could never find the counterpart. Uh, it was shocking how badly that was handled within J.P. Morgan. So the, you have to write these regulations so that they limit speculative activity, but not limit uh, responsible activity. And you can't do it by class of assets. You have to do it by very careful look at their books. And that's why they get such careful inspection and why the rules have to be written so very carefully. Well, uh, the uh, mistakes were made not only by financial institutions, but also by households. Think about a household that decides to take out a new mortgage. And the mortgage says, you're paying below market rate of interest, you're paying no principal, but the end of five years, there's gonna be a balloon payment in which you catch up on everything. How likely do you think those people thought they were gonna be able to make that balloon payment? They probably knew that they couldn't. Probably they were lying about their income. So uh, you ask yourself, why would a rational person do that? And the answer is the housing bubble. If you thought the price of the property 
that you were buying was going to appreciate significantly during that five years, then you can sell the property, uh, clear the mortgage, and have something left over. So households were speculating exactly the same way the business firm, financial firms were speculating. Well, that wasn't all. Many people who would never have taken out a, uh, a subprime mortgage, they were borrowing the equity in their house. We used to call that second mortgages. That had a bad name to it, so it's equity borrowing now. They would do that and therefore add to their consumption. That was supporting the consumption of many middle class families. Well, that was okay as long as the, their house price was rising, but their house prices fell when the recession hit and their loans were underwater. Once a loan goes underwater and you think of it rationally, you say, why do I pay any of this mortgage? Even if you're capable of paying the mortgage, the, some rationality would say, why well, pay it all? Well, the house price will never go back to cover the loans we have outstanding. And you get uh, many, many more houses in foreclosure than, you, than just the subprime mortgage. When the crisis hit, uh, the standard uh, judgment was, well, subprimes are only about 15% of the outstanding. We can manage that but the problem was much greater than 15%. It included all of those people who had uh, borrowed equity out of their house and their house went underwater. But of course, that was not the only source of their debt. Uh, they were borrowing on credit cards as well. So we had a consumption culture that was excessive so the households uh, were probably responsible. Well, uh, if that's so, then we have a more serious problem. It can only be compared not to those earlier uh, post-war recessions of the US, but to the Great Depression when we had wholesale bank failures a similar situation of financial distress. And this is not an income crisis alone, it's a balance sheet crisis. Uh, and that means that the financial firms themselves had to recapitalize. Uh, that is to uh, issue uh, equity or, uh, or long-term debt in order to improve their short-term uh, asset position. And households really had to pay off debt. And the only way to do that is to save out of your income, which means lowering consumption. So we've had a very, very weak comp uh, uh, recovery. However, we have had a recovery. That differentiates this period from the Great Depression. The Great Depression, the government, uh, uh, according to Milton Friedman, the Federal Reserve didn't know what it was doing. And rather than trying to expand the money supply, it acted to contract the money supply. And the government didn't really do anything. Hoover said, prosperity's right around the corner. We never got to that corner. Uh, this time, we did it differently. After um, uh, Lehman Brothers failed, the Congress passed TARP. And that gave a huge pot of money which the government could use to bail out banks, to keep them open, to invest in firms, uh, and take over some, 
in order to keep the economy going. And in addition, we had the greatest amount of stimulus in terms of the budget in any one year that we've ever had. Now, I know Paul Krugman argues that we made a mistake, that the stimulus program was not big enough. However, it was by a dimension larger than anything we've ever done in a single policy, and it was the judgment that the Congress would not accept an even larger amount. So uh, we had the two things, TARP, which was directed to taking, uh, preventing bankruptcy, and, um, and the government uh, stimulus program. Third, we went to uh, the Federal Reserve, rather than raising interest rates, they dropped it to between zero and 25%, which is historic again. We've never had zero interest rates. Even during World War II, when the Treasury had an agreement with the Fed, they only reduced the interest rate to 1%. Well, could it have been done better? If you want to replay history, a mistake may have been made before Lehman Brothers with Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns was a, a reasonably well-run and very respected bank, uh, bond house in New York. And they created mortgage pools like everyone else. Not particularly aggressive, but when the market started to go south, they doubled down. Rather than starting to shrink their portfolio, they doubled it because they didn't believe the downturn would last. Well, on a weekend, uh, Bear Stearns couldn't make the payroll for the following week. They were really cash strapped. And the Fed, the Treasury, and the New York financial community said, let's save Bear Stearns by selling it to J.P. Morgan. That's the mistake. You see, maybe Bear Stearns should have been permitted to go bankrupt. Because when you tell the financial community that if you're a financial firm that's notable and you're about to go bankrupt, somehow it'll be saved. You don't have to worry about bankruptcy. So keep betting. Uh, it's uh, a, a problem that political scientists have long recognized. Uh, it is a problem of sending a bad message to the market. Now, how much different other firms would have behaved like Lehman Brothers if Bear Stearns had gone bankrupt? You can't really replace history. When Lehman Brothers came up, similar problem, except this time Lehman Brothers is a bigger firm with lots of international complications. And uh, uh, J.P. Morgan didn't want to buy it. No one else wanted to buy it. How about the government bailing it out? What the Secretary of the Treasury said is that we do not have the legal authorization to buy out Lehman Brothers. So Lehman Brothers was permitted to go bankrupt and the consequences was this financial distress around the world and including in the United States. Well, it was Lehman Brothers and the disturbances that followed it that led Congress to pass TARP. Uh, that is, during the Bush administration, TARP was passed. And maybe TARP has a long shadow because the origin of the Tea Party was TARP. That was the government action that the Tea Party said, why is the government helping all of these big banks? They never helped me. The, uh, the thinking of overstretching of the government 
was directed at TARP. That was the organizing uh, cry for the people who wanted to rein in government action. So this period is a fascinating period. Uh, it'll no doubt be written about by historians, but it's yet not settled. Well, when we see that uh, the balance sheet crisis was being addressed, nevertheless, it caused its own problem. And the consequences were government debt. During the recession, revenues went down, expenditures went up, the government deficit ballooned. So uh, how to deal with government deficits? Well, uh, it reached 10% of GDP uh, in one year. Uh, and that just struck the Congress and probably the people to the degree they understood it that this is not sustainable and we have to do something about it. So they tried the big deal to uh, reduce it over time, uh, addressing in addition to uh, expenditures, revenues were to go up, and that deal fell apart, uh, and we got sequestration uh, as, the, uh, as the attempt to force the Congress to come to a long-term deal, which never happened, so sequestration took place. Now, what is sequestration? It's the stupidest way to cut expenditures. It says every program in every department gets cut by an equal amount. That means the very good programs, the not so good, maybe even the bad programs, all get cut equally. It's the stupidest way to cut expenditures and I believe it's necessary. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer in across the board cuts. Well, my observation over the years is that democratic governments are incapable of cherry picking programs to cut. The only way to get government expenditures cut is across the board. Democratic institutions, however, are able to pick priorities to increase government expenditures. <laughs> so the only way to do this is cut below where you want to be and then start to increase selectively. Uh, and uh, that's not only true in the United States. Uh, the lesson was taught to me first by the UK that went into er problems like this earlier. So uh, the sequestration was, uh, was uh, instituted with huge cuts and we've been sustained by monetary policy. Remember what I said, monetary policy is more powerful than fiscal policy. You know what direction you're getting with fiscal policy, you never know its full impact. Monetary policy is powerful enough to overcome fiscal policy in the opposite direction. And that's where we are. It's, uh, sequestration is taking a toll, but not forcing us into another recession, as it has in Europe. So what is our short-term challenge? It's to look at what has happened as a consequences of long-term unemployment. That is where uh, you get uh, uh, the uh, labor force loses its skills. This happened in my family. Uh, I was born in 1929. Uh, my father was a metallurgist working for the Hudson Motor Car Company in Detroit. In 1930, he lost his job. He was never able to get a job as a metallurgist again. 
Uh, after some difficult years, he ended up in the dry cleaning business and made enough money for me to go to college, uh, but he never could uh, uh, have his skill again. The uh, second factor is, and that's a loss to the economy. His skill loss is a loss to the economy. The, in addition, people become discouraged and they leave the labor force. And as you know from all of this analysis, that also is a cost to society, to the economy. So those are the things that uh, uh, we have to recognize as a short-term consequence of, uh, of the uh, uh, recession. But, and of course, it has human costs as well. Uh, I don't know the literature all that well, but from what I read, within families, divorce is more likely, is brought on by unemployment. Uh, aggressive behavior uh, is often brought on by unemployment. Uh, and society becomes discouraged. I, the, uh, uh, the Americans public are optimistic people. Yet now, when you ask them what direction is the country going, the answer is it's going in the wrong direction. Uh, it, the uh, long-term unemployment uh, has this impact of discouraging people, discouraging society. But there's a political cost as well. And that is a loss of faith in institutions, particularly in Washington, D.C. And if you look at attitudes around the country uh, about what do they think of Washington, it's almost not an issue of Republican or Democrat. It's Washington. It doesn't work. The society, the political system is broken. Uh, the institutions don't work. Uh, and that's a serious political issue, uh, along with being a partisan issue. Well, let's uh, look at some medium-term challenges. That's, I think, the short-term challenge is the long-term unemployment and its consequences. The medium-term challenge is the budget. I say medium-term because there's no evidence that the U.S. has borrowed too much to be able to sustain itself. People who think the U.S. could come Greece <laughs> do not understand anything about the budget. The critical difference is a country that borrows in its own currency versus a country like Greece that borrows in a foreign currency. Uh, Euro, in a sense, is their currency, but it's not theirs alone. So they have to earn euros to pay it off from the rest of the world. The U.S. is a dollar currency. Uh, we borrow in our own currency. Are there other countries that do this? Japan. Japan has borrowed 300% of any income they have. And they continue to be able to borrow at very low interest rates. Why? Japanese buy Japanese bonds. Uh, and they've had a balance of payments position that doesn't require a lot of borrowing abroad. So, uh, the U.S. is not going to face an immediate problem. Uh, uh, the budget problem will be, could be managed in the medium term. Well, how serious is the budget problem? Well, the red is expenditures and the blue are revenue, so this gap is the, is the deficit and it reached 10% of GDP. 
Now it's improved sharply uh, by a combination of expenditure declines and revenue increases. Let's look at those, starting with expenditures. What is the problem in the medium run of excessive expenditures? The most serious is medical costs, and that's not, uh, that preceded Obamacare. That's not Obamacare. That's Medicare. We're talking about expenditures of the federal government. That's uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, if you looked at the combination, those who know me from before know I've given this lecture before, that if we, the trend towards rising expenditures, if that trend continued, if you used a ruler on it, you would discover that it would absorb the entire budget of the United States uh, in 20, 30 years. Does that include armed forces, me medical expenditures? Good question. The question is, does it include the expenditure for uh, the uh, retired military? And I think it does, but I have to go back to the source to make sure it does. Uh, the, uh, fortunately, and we don't know completely why, the trend towards rising expenditures has started to, uh, to bend. The curve is bended, it hasn't gone down, but the rise in price and quantity seems to be such that we're, the rise of expenditures has been going up less. How do we know we have too much? because we have twice as much as any other industrial country. Now, we know developing countries have low levels of government expenditures on medical care, but other advanced countries, twice the percentage of GDP we spend versus other industrial countries. So we have a problem in medical care. Uh, we we, I don't think it's understood yet why the curve has started to bend. Uh, maybe the beginning of Oma, Obamacare helps it. If we are getting more concentration on keeping people well rather than just treating them when they're sick, that may be a fundamental change in attitude, but that, uh, it's, there are no, no data to show that that's happening. So the most uh, medical care is the most serious issue. Second is Social Security. Uh, there will be fewer people paying into the system than there used to be and more retirees. Uh, the trust fund, I think, will be exhausted in 2030 and we have to deal with it now. Why do we have to deal with it now? Because you can't wait to the last minute. People who count on Social Security and retirement can't be told a year or two before they retire that they're not gonna get so much. They had no plans to recoup in greater savings before they retire. So you have to do it with enough lead time so that families can adjust to the change. Well, we've done this before. This is not the first time we faced a, a, a parent shortfall in Social Security. It's, in that sense, a simple problem because we know the path to solution. The path to solution is raising the cap on how much of your income is subject to Social Security tax so that the receipts of the Social Security system are increased and you delay the retirement age a bit. Uh, and that's been going on. Are, is there a social ground for extending the uh, retirement age? Clearly there is. People are living longer, they're healthier, 
they want to stay in the labor force longer. So therefore, extending uh, 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 Social Security age doesn't seem to me to be a sharp departure from our social mores that we've had in the country. But it has to be dealt with and dealt with soon. The third is defense. Defense has ballooned since 9-11. And it raises the question, how much is enough? How much do we really need in defense? We know in past, defense expenditures have been cut when wars have ended. But the threat of 9-11 hasn't ended in the minds of the government. But do we need all this expenditures? Does Homeland Security, the expansion, their square footage of, of office space increased nine times the size of the Pentagon since 9-11. Uh, and you give uh, funds to the military, they'll find a way to spend them. This is a reminder of where we are. We've reduced the deficit from about 10% of GDP to about 5%. So we've made very significant progress, but clearly there's further to go. And the question is, in the abstract, what could be sustainable? What size of deficit uh, might indicate sustainability? And the answer that economists have come up with is, if it's growing, no faster than the rate of growth, which I'm pegging at 2.7%, then uh, it is sustainable over time because the debt to GDP ratio will not go up. Uh, I'm not completely happy with that because it implies that you get to 2.7% and you stop my view, I'm a, as, you, as I told you in the first lecture, I'm a fiscal conservative. I think you have to go better than that because during recessions you're going to do much worse. So if over time you're going to hit 2.7 percent, uh, you can't stop when you get to 2.7 percent. Okay, when you, get, when you raise the question defense, you raise the question how much is enough? Well, that raises fundamental questions because it asks, what is the role of the United States in the world? What role do we want it to play? Do we want the U.S. to be the world's policeman, righting every wrong, changing every government that is bad for its people, uh, entering uh, with force everywhere that we see bad things happening. Are we really prepared to do that? Is that what we want? Or is it something less? We know the U.S. is alone among, there is no equal to the U.S. And people look to the U.S. What do they really want the U.S. to do? Uh, one uh, analyst describes it as they want the U.S. to be a housekeeper. That is to help bring stability where there is the uh, possibility of external action helping to stabilize things, not to destabilize things. Well, if you choose this second definition, you need much less military maybe more other things to intervene, aid or whatever, uh, in order to help stabilize circumstances. You don't have a planning to, uh, to intervene. Personally, I am very uh, askance at worst case planning planning by the military for the worst case scenario. I heard a recent presentation about Korea and planning for worst case scenario. 
they say, you know, uh, suppose South Korea, uh, uh, North Korea has a missile that can hit the U.S. with an atomic weapon capability. And we see it on the launch pad. How are we going to take care of that? And the answer is, of course, we could hit it with a nuclear weapon to be sure to bring it out. But that would be unacceptable to the whole world. Therefore, we need to be able to hit it with conventional weapons. That means facilities, and, and since these, mo these missiles are mobile, the launchers are mobile, you have to prepare for it to be almost any place in North Korea. So you need lots of facilities in Japan that could hit North Korea, lots of facilities in South Korea that could hit North Korea with conventional Westerns. No one thinks, suppose you bring about that, what are the North Koreans going to think? Do they think that you have peaceful intentions? Uh, worst case scenario planning is terrible when you come to trying to judge military needs. But it is a larger uh, question, uh, what are the priorities? Uh, I can't give you an answer. Uh, it's as much a, uh, a political question, more of a political question than an economic question, but it's a serious question for this society. Well, how about revenues? Let's go back. Our revenues have been 18%, went above 20% during the uh, uh, administration of uh, uh, Clinton, right. And we had prosperity. There's nothing that says you can't have revenues with higher taxes and destroy prosperity. Then we got the Bush tax cuts and it dropped down to one of the lowest levels that we've ever had in recent history. Well, what is the right level? I can't give you a number, but uh, in the Congress, they're talking about 18%. And expenditures at about 20%. So the bigger cut must come in the expenditures and a relatively small rise in revenues uh, to reach that their target is a 2% deficit per year. Well, that's a basic political choice to make of the society, how much to tax ourselves. The, in addition, you have to make a decision of the distribution of taxes. Who is it that's going to pay this? Uh, and uh, uh, how progressive do you want your tax system? And how is it to be collected? It uh, eventually falls on families, but in the first instance, do you want it to be on business firms? Or do you want to collect it from households directly? The, uh, uh, the reform we needed for taxes requires a significant public debate, which we've hardly started. Uh, but that's one of the things facing us in the future, along with discussion of military priorities. Well, how about the long term? What is our long term challenge? And I think it is unequal distribution of income and wealth. We've had this problem before. It's not brand new in the United States. When we had industrialization in the 1870s, 90s, we had unequal, the robber barons. When we had the 1920s, the Gilded Age, uh, we had uh, unequal distribution of income. Both of those events led to crises. And the crises themselves uh, 
created the uh, correction for the maldistribution. Uh, do we need a crisis to get over this? I'm not sure. Uh, I hope not. The trends, however, are serious. Middle class incomes have not gone up for probably over 20 years. And uh, increasingly, the growth of income is concentrated in the top 10 percent, and especially in the top 1 percent. Uh, and we may have had this before, but we didn't have the statistics before. Now we see how much is concentrated in a, a very few number of households. Well, uh, what are the consequences of this? You get uh, a, a rejection of the American creed. The American creed says you work hard, you play by the rules, you save a reasonable amount, you reach uh, middle class, and your children will be better off than you were. And that does not seem to hold anymore. And that is a serious social issue. In addition, uh, of course, other countries are having the uh, the same problem, I realize I skipped causes. Let's go back a moment. The causes of maldistribution, there are two main causes. Technology, which emasculates the skills of many people that were earning uh, for uh, middle class incomes. Those skills don't uh, matter anymore. They've been replaced by machines. And uh, uh, globalization. Uh, as we've been told, the world is flat. Uh, competition for those jobs occurs everywhere in the world. You try to get information from a information on some electrical product, very likely you're talking to the Philippines. Uh, the world is flat. It meant that the uh, Americans are not dominant in any of uh, this kind of skill. Uh, you buy it abroad cheaper, and that's what the firm not only does, but required to do. That's what profit maximization tells it to do. Well, the consequences are that you get uh, this loss of the American creed, and there are social and political costs. If we get a permanent underclass in the United States, that has social consequences. Of course, this has occurred in other countries, but it's interesting now, if you are born in poverty, your chances of getting out of poverty are better in many other countries now than they are in the US, and it never was that case in the past. Other countries seem to be doing, if not marginally, may better how much better is hard to say, but we know we are not doing very well. Well, what are the policy alternatives? What could we do about this if we wanted to do something about it? Well, the most basic is education, and particularly in the very early years. Other countries have had great success in getting kids babies uh, be about three years old, if not somewhat earlier, into learning process. We happen to have a friend uh, whose uh, child is raising children in Sweden. And they have classes for one and a half year olds. And this early learning is critical. Uh, we need, we may, if we wanted to solve this problem, that would be early childhood development education would be where we'd want to spend money. Second, worker training. Skills are lost. And these workers will not be able to get the same kind of job they used to get. Uh, a, 
and therefore they need to be trained, they need to be retrained because skills are lost over time. If you lost a skill and you got retrained and that was replaced, you're much more willing to be trained again. You're in the process of constantly uh, being retrained and that will sustain much of your income. Third, minimum wage. There are some jobs which cannot be replaced by imports. You don't import your quick hamburger. Uh, that skill, that job can be impacted by the minimum wage. It used to be thought, oh, that was a teenager earning pocket money. Not so. That is often the major breadwinner and uh, we have not raised the minimum wage in a number of years. Uh, it needs to be uh, raised and it ought to be indexed for inflation at the same time. And finally, progressive taxation. That's the issue for the top 10% and the top 1%. If you, for instance, uh, solved your Social Security problem by removing the cap entirely from earnings, so you paid a Social Security tax your whole income level, that would be a progressive tax that would solve more than solve our, our Social Security problem. Indeed, they'd have money left over to improve benefits some. So uh, those are four possible approaches. There may be others that I haven't thought of, but those are things we ought to think about if we want to really address this long-term problem of income inequality. Well, how do we conclude? I truly believe the U.S. is a blessed country. Not only our natural resources, not only our diverse people, but we have had political stability for 150 years. That is a gigantic achievement. As I said on the first lecture, I am basically an optimist and none of these problems, short term, medium term or long term, dissuades me from being an optimist. Thank you.